We worship His holy name. That's the goal of church, isn't it? Having said that, look at the, the fellowship. Look how we enjoy to be with each other. That's why we, for, for some of you who, who have, are visiting, we have built in fellowship in our service because we were blessed by it. We, we learn from each other. We, we grow from each other's zeal and joy and passion. And I know a lot of you guys are here to serve the Lord, and we, we're ex excited to hang out and to see what the Lord has done in your ministries, but in your lives. And so remember that in a week. You know, you pray, you read the scriptures, which is part of discipleship. But as you're with brothers and sisters throughout the week, you grow from each other. You are en enthused by each other's passion for Christ. Or are you? Have you spent time with Christians in the last few days? so that they could pour into your life. Make sure you do. And it will ch change the way you see your Christian faith. We're in the book of John, as you know. We have begun a series called Come Unto Me. And we'll be in the book of John probably three years. And so don't worry when we take a little hiatus and we go travel different routes, which shows us other angles of the King of Kings, which we discover week after week in the book of John. Today, we will talk about love. And the title of our message is Being Rooted and Grounded in His Love. Being Rooted and Grounded in His Love. Because as we're about to enter this whole Christmas season, it's already begun, one of the things that we wonder about is what is that coming about? Why did Jesus come on this earth? Why was he born as an infant? And of course, of course, we'll talk about that closer to Christmas itself, but it's obviously the greatest expression of love is his coming. But today we're not so much talking about his coming on earth, but what was he here to accomplish? How did he express his love toward us humans? And what does it mean for us as we evangelize, as we reach out to those around? What is the love of God able to do and not meant to do? And so I pray that you will be encouraged and that you will understand that Christ's greatest expression of love, of course, is the giving of himself. Many, many, many years ago, tribes once roamed the Russian expense, just like many Native American or Autochton, as we call them here, would roam the Americas. The tribes in Russia that controlled the hunting grounds and the best resources were often led by the strongest and wisest leaders of the day. There's a story that tells us that one day, Someone in the tribe of that great chief started to steal, to go in the different huts and, and structures and rob people from their goods. The leader issued a proclamation that the thief, when captured, would receive as many as 40 lashes, knowing that only a few could survive such a severe beating. Despite the warning, the thievery continued even as the leader upped the level of punishment. One day, the thief was finally apprehended. And to the horror of everyone, the thief turned out to be the leader's own aged mother. One of his laws required children to take care of their mothers and their dads to honor father and mother. But then again, the same law that he had proclaim and told the tribe this thief had to be punished the whipping had to happen finally the day came the tribe gathered around a large post the leader soon entered and sat down on his throne then two towering warriors led the frail mother into the compound and tied her to the post Finally, the executioner, a powerful man with bulging muscles, entered carrying a long leather whip. As he approached the little frail woman, the warrior gently took off the back of the garment, exposing the frail back, bony structure and all. 
The executioner took his stance. His great arm cracked the whip in the air as he prepared to bring it directly on the mom's back. Just when the leader held up his breath, everybody was quiet. He raised his hand, the chief, to stop the beating. Everybody sighed of relief. They thought, that's it. He's going to spare the mom. The leader rose from his throne and strode toward the mother. As he walked, he removed his own shirt, tossing it aside, and then he wrapped his great arms around the mother, exposing his large muscular back to the whipmaster, bringing a heavy silence. He said, proceed to the punishment. The mom was there. She was beaten, but she was protected by the king. Jesus came so that we would receive our penalty, shielded by him. He himself took on the penalty so that God's honor would be respected. God's law would be respected. You could have said, no, mom, just walk away. We erase this one. Or if it's your son or somebody you know, your daughter or friends. But then the chief would have been seen as a fake, as a man who did not respect his word. Also, who did not consider the law and truth important. Do you know love when you see it? When you stare at it in the face, how, what does it look like for you? We've been told all we need is love. What is love? Is it the love of your wife, your daughter, your son, your friend who gives you a hug? You know, you hang out with each other. Is it what the world sings about, paints about, acts about, sell? You know, the love that we are been peddled around the world is maybe not true love. It might be the world standard. And for us as Christians, it shall not be so among us. In 1 John chapter 4, in 1 John chapter 4, we have an amazing reminder of what that love is. And so come with me as we journey on this essential part of Christmas, that Christ was born as an infant, yes, but he was meant to die. And that is the greatest expression of God's great love. In chapter 4 of 1 John, let's start in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and know God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so, Father, we thank you that you remind us what true love is. Oh, we love love. We want love. We long to be love, to be married, to be embraced, to have children, to have those jump on us. We, we long for the love of a mother, of a good dad. We long for passionate love. But could, it, could this only be truly found in Jesus Christ? Father, as we question these things, speak to our hearts. Reveal more of your truth to us and help us to apply it as we serve the King of Kings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 1 John 3, 16a, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. You know love. You know what true love is. It's right there on that verse. He has given his life for us. You see, Jesus is the first and the last of everything. He's the first and the last. If you look back at the first time that the word love is mentioned in Genesis 22, 2, then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering 
on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Obviously, we see the model of giving your son. We see that that is prototype of what God was going to do with his son, Jesus Christ. And it's the first time that love is mentioned. Love is important. Love changes everything. But it's got to be the right kind of love. And the last time that the word love is used in the New Testament, of course, is in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. And it speaks of what? The washing by his blood, yeah? To wash anything with your blood, it's going to cost you. You better love whatever you're going to wash. Because to remove, I cut myself recently, cutting through a bagel. And that new set of knives, cheap but sharp, went right through my flesh. I mean, that sensation was surreal. And the blood splatted. And I, you know, I had the right little bandage and I didn't have to go to the hospital. I praised the Lord, but it was, it was gushing. And so, you know what? Blood cost. And I still remember to this day, ah! so you can imagine to wash anything with your blood as Jesus did practically and figuratively will cost you a lot. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. To him who loved us and washed us. You see, the love of the Father and the Son is in fact expressed in the giving, in the giving of the life of Jesus Christ. But you know what? That love was so precious that Jesus and the Father enjoyed it from all of eternity. We're told when we studied the book of John chapter 1 that they were cross face to face. The Father and the Son, the Logos was with God. They hung out, man, for a billion years and they looked at each other and they loved each other and they, they, they looked at the creation. I don't know exactly what they did, but you can imagine the love between the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father. In John 15, verse 9, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. I mean, I was really loved by my Father. I still am. But when he's on the cross, the greatest pain for Jesus is that love is removed for a, a short time as he bears the sin of the world. The love is the giving of self. John 15, 13, Jesus says this, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. And of course, we think of soldiers, we think of moms and dads who have died for people that, that were around them. And maybe you've heard of great stories of people giving the ultimate price for their love. But Jesus died for those who were ungodly, who couldn't care less, who were harsh, or did he? We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, did Jesus love the whole world? And yes, we have no choice but to think about theological truths because we can get gushy and warm and fuzzy. And ooh, Jesus loves everyone. Ooh, kumbaya. Does he? Well, you'll see in a moment. You'll see how theologically it's defendable, but it has to be sharp, brothers and sisters. You can't just splatter fake love and say it's going to be okay because many will not enter the kingdom of God. Did Jesus love the whole world and therefore died for the whole world? God's salvific stance toward his fallen world. We got to discuss that. And of course, we're not going to answer all and all questions has been debated for 2,000 years. But we'll, we'll touch it and you can make your own ideas of what seems right. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3, 16, you know that. He gave his son for the world. It's an offering for sin to satisfy his own wrath, like this king for his toward the mums. And, and he, 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 he paid for the justice, and he received the justice and provided salvation of the sinners. Now, the word world, the world, the world, world here refers to the elect, or does it? Does it refer only uh, to a specific group of people? Now, to understand that, 
And you've got to see the way the word is used throughout John's gospel. And of course, we won't exhaustively do that. But world in John's description is not so much size as in the whole planet Earth, but it's evil. It speaks of the system of the world, the moral order in willful and culpable rebellion against God. In John 3.16, God's love is sending the Lord Jesus to be giving of himself to the entirety of the world or to the entirety of the wickedness of the world. Now, in 1 John 2.2, 2, in 1 John 2.2, 2, it's not on the screen, but uh, it's, it's there a little later, or maybe it is. Oh, good. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but only for also for the whole world. Oh, okay, wait, not just the world, the whole world. So now it's starting to speak of all the sins, all the badness of the system, because the world is a system. It's a, it's a set of rules that has been imposed upon all of us by the stores, by the media, by everything around you. Cosmos is what the world or the system wants you to live by. But now it says that he died for the whole world. So sin, which is badness, whole, which would mean wholeness or all of the badness, bigness, bigness, badness, all of that stuff is what Jesus dies for. So, as you can see, we're advancing here. In Johannine theology, the disciples themselves once belonged to the world, but were drawn, drawn out of it. On this axis, God's love for the world cannot be only for the elect. You see, God also presents himself as the God who invites and commands all humans in the whole bad world to come out of the cosmos, the system of the world. He orders his people to carry the gospel to the farthest corner of the world, proclaiming it to men and women everywhere, everywhere. Now, Ezekiel 33.11 says this, As surely as I live... I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the badness we talked about, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? You see, God is concerned. God is not looking down and saying, only a few can be saved. The rest I could not care, but he calls all to come forth, all to come out. Having said that, let's calm down. It is true that these truths are intention. These truths are intention in the word because not everyone will come out. No, sorry. You can preach till you're blue in the face at minus 20 on the streets of Montreal. Not everyone will come to the gospel knowledge. Why is that? Is Christ's death not sufficient, not efficacious? Is it not working? The truths are intention. Having said that, it is best not to introduce disjunctions and disconnections where God himself has not introduced them. If one holds, listen to this, that the expiation or the atonement is sufficient for all and effective for the elect, then both sets of texts and concerns are accommodated. So, both truths are in the Scripture. That Jesus did die for the elect. He did die for those who will receive. But he also calls all badness and wholeness to come forth. And so men have been grappling and women have been grappling, grappling these truths forever. I was reading Charles Spurgeon this morning and how he was talking about the love of God. And he was talking about how in evangelism that becomes so important because you can become harsh and say, why should I preach on the streets of Montreal if I don't know who the elect is? I'm wasting my time. But then again, he is saying, out of love, you go and you share the goodness of Jesus Christ, knowing that many more are elect, or as Spurgeon says, 
Save the elect and then elect some more. How about that? So basically, it's never ending. He's electing, man. He's electing more and more. And so you're in that dichotomy, but you're resting because you don't know where one begin and one end. Both are true. In 1 John 2, 2, we saw that the whole world. It states something about the potential breath of the atonement. Understand that in John, people did that, and do, they do that today. In hyper-Calvinism, they will you know, believe in double predestination, that people are born to go to hell. They're, they're called for hell from the get-go. Bummer, I hope it's not any of our kids. And so they go really far in that dichotomy that some are saved and some are unsavable. Sad. Well, the historical context of John in 1 John is that there were men like that. The hypernostics of the day, maybe like the hyper-Calvinist of today, were saying, we're chosen, we're special. And in fact, indeed, John was clarifying it was not for the sake of the Jews only, for example, or this group or this Gnostic group, but for many more that he has come. He wanted the sins of the whole world to be washed. Listen to this sentence. Pot potentially for all without distinction, rather than effectively for all without exception. Potentially for all without distinction, effectively for all without exception. Now, if everybody was going to be saved, you could say Jesus loves everyone, Everyone's called, everyone's elected, everyone will be saved. I want that. Don't get me wrong. I really long for this revival. But I'm not the revivalist type because for 27 years, I've seen so few of those that have evangelized. Maybe it's because I'm really bad at it. But I've seen some of the great evangelists work for years and see just a few fruit. Of course, there'll be more fruit in heaven. Thank God we don't see them all. We'd be prideful. But God is doing a work that is surprising, but he's doing it in his own time, in his own way. Listen to this. Because the Lord loves you, in his great light, it's not in the Bible, it's just a little thing that we come up with. Because the Lord loves you, in his great light of the world, he bathes all of this world with merciful love, okay? His light... Jesus, I'm the light of the world, bathes the entire world. But you take that whole light, but you use a searchlight now. You're looking very precisely. With a searchlight, God decides in his sovereignty where he will focus his salvific love. So the whole world is bathed in love. But the specific searchlight of the love of God will then bring people out of darkness. But those around can't say, oh, I don't, I'm not chosen. I'm not in the light. Yeah, you're in the light. Because as Romans says, you have no excuse. Light is everywhere. You, you are witnessing God's great mercy, but you don't want it. And maybe when the searchlight comes your way, you hide. You don't want to be saved. Deuteronomy 7 7 and 8 says this, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all people. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, listen to this, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. It's not because you were chosen or special, but because God went and out of love wanted to remove you from a life of sin. 1 Timothy 4.10 For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men especially of those who believe. Isn't that amazing? All men are saved, especially those who believe. Okay, so, wow, those truths are really intention. They're really intention. D.A. Carson, a great theologian, educated in Cambridge, England, author and editor of more than 45 books, and he's from Montreal. I saw him teach many times. Really sweet guy. Says this, 
I argue then that both Armenians, which is a system of theological thinking, and Calvinist, should rightly affirm that Christ died for all, in the sense that Christ's death was sufficient for all, and that Scripture portrays God as inviting, commending, desiring the salvation of all out of love, says D.A. Carson. Further, he continues, all Christians ought to confess that in slightly different sense, Jesus Christ, in the intent of God, died effectively for the elect alone. Oh, really? Yes, effectively, he saved those that are saved. He died for those who will receive that salvation. The elect may be the entire nation of Israel or of the church as a body or individual. In each case, God, he continues, sets his affection on his chosen ones in a way in which he does not set his affection on others. He says that the church is loved in a specific way. Yet, God loves the world, the whole bad world, the system, but he loves specifically his church. If you don't like the word elect, I understand, but he loves you as a saved one, as his child. Oh, I love all kids. Kids rock. But I really love my daughter. She is really cute and she smells good. The other kids are cute. But you know, I, I have focused my searchlight on her. So that's a little bit, in a poor way, maybe how God loves those that he is saving, has saved. First John 4.14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. The Son as the Savior of the world. Now, universalism is risky. It's the idea that everybody will be saved. If you just work hard, everyone in Montreal will one day Fill the churches, as I saw recently in a, uh, in a, in, in a moment with Christian people, the, 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 the woman pastor said, my goal is to fill the, the bell center with Christians. That can be your goal. You can try. You can try really hard. But unless God brings his searchlight on many more, well, you'll be what we are. A, a remnant battling to stay with the Lord. And I'm not somebody who don't believe that God can do great things. I've seen him do great things. But I know he's doing it in his way, in his time. He's the only Savior to whom anyone in the world can turn for forgiveness and eternal life. It is a sincere, tender-hearted, compassionate love that offers mercy and forgiveness, even to the rebellious. It's not on the screen. I just added that this morning. But Romans 10, 20 to 21, an amazing verse. Listen to this. Paul says, quoting Isaiah, but Isaiah is very bold and says, I found by those who did not seek me, I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, Paul continues in Romans 1, 21, 10, 21, but to Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Wow. You see, God is reaching out to the worst of the worst. He's not because that thing of election would make you feel like you're chosen, therefore special. Not at all. Maybe you're worse. Maybe God says, well, I better put my searchlight on you before you kill others, you kill yourself, or you just bring such havoc in this world. Biblically, we cannot escape the conclusion that God's benevolent, merciful love is unlimited in its extent, even to the Jews when they were completely away, rebellious to God. Now, in the New Testament, that story is found in Mark 10. That same teaching, the rich young ruler in Mark 10, 21. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's a bit before. One thing you lack, Jesus says. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. That's a true invitation. Well, of course, he's inviting this guy because this guy is elected. This guy's chosen. This guy's special. That's why Jesus pours into him. Well, that's not exactly what happens, is it? 
What's amazing is that the young man declines. You know, two things he refused to do. He would not acknowledge his sin. This is what the people in Quebec, especially, you may have noticed, will not say, I'm not a sinner. What's sin? I don't see that. I'm a good person. But not only I'm a good person, but I'm a thinker. I'm a philosopher. I'm a, I've found freedom. Not only that, but he would not bow to Christ's lordship. He shut himself out from eternal life, even though he looked like he was looking for it. And that's the last time we hear of that rich, young ruler. The saddest thing, man, he never pops up again. As far as the biblical record is concerned, he remained forever in unbelief and is now burning in hell. Mark 10, 21a, but, listen to this, Jesus looking at him loved him. Wow. Do you understand that this guy was not elected? He was not chosen. He was not to be saved. He's not saved. He's in hell. Because otherwise the Bible would have told us otherwise. Like Nicodemus. We see at the beginning he's searching. At the end he's helping to bury Jesus. You see a salvation like the woman at the well, like many others. But Jesus loved him. That's what fuels our evangelism. Jesus loves. Those that may say never. He loves. He cares. He cries over Jerusalem. He has true love. And so let no theological system make you feel otherwise. Make no other theological system give you an excuse for not loving your neighbor. Your gay neighbor, your harsh neighbor, your lying neighbor, your whatever neighbor, whatever stroke you on the wrong way. Love for Jesus. Love that rich, young ruler, though he was not going to come to him. Here we are explicitly told that Jesus loved an overt, open, non-repentant, non-submissive Christ rejecter. He loves him. That's my point. Love and be an example of that man, that woman who goes out, searchlight and all. Not only that, but be a light bearer. The love of God was manifested. It's the gift of Christmas in Christ, there's a manifestation of his love. First John chapter 4, verse 9, we saw that earlier. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Yeah, that's Christmas. He was born in Bethlehem as an infant. He was sent there to become propitiation for our sins. What do we want to be born to be a propitiation? What is that? What do you want? What do you, why, why do you want to take the sins of the whole world on your back? You're just an infant. You're just a man. Now you're God. You're going to pay for the sins of the world. The love of God is dynamic. It's active. It's vibrant. It's powerful. God has manifested his love and displayed it in a beautiful, beautiful way. Sacrifice. Atonement for sin propitiation. Now, do you deserve love? Do I deserve his love? Are you lovely, lovable? Because of his great love with which he loved us, the Bible says. Now, as sinners, we're recipient of God's love by the grace of God alone. That's central. That's the gospel. The gospel is the good news to the worst of us. The worst of those that you want to share too, Jesus died for them. Yes. He has a plan for them. Romans 5, 6 to 9 says this, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. We spoke about that earlier. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Beautiful. Not for the righteous. Not for those who you could say, wow, these guys are really chosen. That's a chosen bunch. That's a religious folk, man. If I've ever seen one, that guy should be saved. I'm going to focus on him. I'm going to put my ministry toward her because she's going to bear good fruit. Well, you know what? Jesus didn't do that. He took the worst of the worst. He took me and yanked me out of a life of great sin. And many of you 
so that he would be magnified. The good news is not that God is willing to overlook sin and forgive sinners. He's not overlooking and forgiving. That would be compromised. Like the, the, the chief would come and say, Mama, hey guys, let's give her a chance. Look at her. She's frail. Could you cook me some meatballs or something? Wrong country. Uh, a barsh or, you know, that soup, Russian soup. No, that would compromise the king here, but God's holiness. You can't have a king who doesn't see sin and care for sin. That would trample his own righteousness. That would not be love on God's part. It would be apathy. Oh, I forgive you because you know what? You're nice. No. The real good news is that the price for sin is paid in full. Tetelestai on the cross, to the max, to the utmost destruction of Jesus' body and the true death of the Son of God on the cross, the price for sin is paid. He took the initiative. He went to the end to save humanity. In the death of Christ, there's the highest possible expression of divine love. He who is love sent his precious son precious son to die as atonement for sin. The cross of Christ gives us the most complete and accurate perspective of God's love and his wrath is perfectly balanced. See, at the cross, his love is shown toward a sinful humanity. Are we bearers of that love? In Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, but God who is rich in mercy, the merciful light I spoke about earlier, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Uh, regeneration, rebirth, by grace you have been saved. So that great love that is merciful, the spotlight or the searchlight that does save you from a life of eternal damnation. And that is why we share the good news of Jesus. That is why we believe that we can bring that searchlight unto the different souls before us. We're excited. God, will you save her, him, them? Will you bring them out of eternal darkness? When you and I were at our most desperate, there was nothing we could do on our own. God did it all. He loved us. He provided us a way to return to him. We were helpless, but he brought his son and gave us the ability to be reunited to him. That sort of selfless, undeserving love is completely beyond our limited, finite comprehension. Whenever we love husband, fathers, mums, uh, wives, friends, we unfortunately tabulate. We count. Okay, well, I'm loving, but am I being loved? And we're so insecure that we always wonder, am I being loved? And we maybe are like that with Jesus. God, I, I'm trying to love you, to, 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 to follow you, but, but am I receiving what I'm meant to receive from you? You got to be rooted and grounded in love. I'm concluding with Ephesians 3.14 to 19. Listen to this. That we would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the heights to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. that You may be filled with all the fullness of God. Do you understand the love of God? The answer is, I don't. I don't, and, but I want to. I want to understand it. I want to be grounded and I want to be rooted in that spectacularly wide and rich and generous and never-ending love. You know, what motivates you in what you do? What is the engine of your life? What's your fuel? Do you still live for yourself even in the most noble things? When you serve God, is it for you? when you love children, spouse, when you serve in the community, when you, I don't know, uh, doctors and politicians and artists, and you do things for a greater value or for self. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, look what should fuel us. For the love of Christ 
compels us. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Brothers and sisters, is love compelling you? True love. Not mere emotions, not legalism, i got to do this because that's going to win my heaven, but true, compassionate, caring, renewed, spiritually love that lives inside of you. Can you say? Do you want to be able to say? Because you know you are loved. This, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. You know what? It's not about me anymore. It's not about what I get in the balance. It's not about what people think of me, my ministry, my parenting, my work, my finances, the fruit of anything. It's about Christ. I, I'm crucified. I have no intrinsic value. I'm a dead body on a cross. But as I die, I start to live. I realize, man, I'm so loved. I fear nothing. I'm running away from nothing. I'm doing everything I do for the love of Christ. I'm compelled, baby. I am not going to stop. Nothing will stop me because the love of God (gasps) is bringing me forward, is pushing me, is lifting me up. It's from all sides. Oh, how we would like the world to understand that love, wouldn't we? We know that people long for love. All you need is love. I want love. Give me love. Please love me. Well, you can look But unless you find it in Christ, you're always going to be disappointed. And so we pray that we would be that light. Uh, Jesus is the light of the world. You have been given a light. Don't put it under a basket. Shine it. And that light is that, that general love for the world around you. And then ask God to be used as a searchlight, as the Holy Spirit worked through you, to help identify who will come in the kingdom next. Ah, I'm so thrilled. Come into the love. And of course, Jesus does it all. You do nothing. But you're there. Wow, you're, you're being born. That is awesome. Just like you, you look at your child being born. You're not doing much. The mom does quite a bit. But even then, she's like, wow, man, get it out of me. You know, it's, it's God that does it all. That's the question from Nicodemus. Uh, Yeah, the Holy Spirit will bring more to be born into the love of God. It's my prayer that we would shine that God and that love of His so strong that people would be ecstatic and wanting to ask, what what is that about you? Where is that from? And so, Father God, if anybody here has not experienced the full love of Christ, which is salvific, Yeah, they sense that they're loved generally, that there is a creator who has allowed them to breathe and to be in church and maybe to even be married and have friends, but they have not experienced that supernatural regeneration, that that salvific love that brings true life. I pray if anybody here is in that state, save them. Surprise us. And bring them into the full expression of your love. You know, we humbly share the word of God now. And as people evangelize and people live a radical lifestyle around, these are just tools you can use by you, by your Holy Spirit. If anyone here, Father, bring that light upon them. Shine upon them. Yank them out. Bring them into great light. And Father, we pray that as Christians who have not fully grasped what it is to be loved by Jesus, that we would, that we would rest in that love. Because yes, we were elected. We were chosen. We were, how about this for a theological term, yanked out of 
pure hell, darkness, destitution, meaningless lifestyle that the world had to offer. The cosmos, the big bad world was getting us. Father, reach out to the whole system and in the whole earth, continue to save. Use us in the process. Thanks for your love, Jesus. And thank you as your birth is about to be celebrated. Thank you that you came in the form of a little infant so that we could relate to you. We could relate to you becoming a teenager and a young adult and an adult and, and then suffer and, and sweat and cry and, and sleep and pray. Thank you, Jesus. We want to love you more. For that, please show us more of your love. It can't come from within. It has to come from outside. The gospel, it's a gift. We don't deserve it. I deserve hell still to this day. And yet, you have promised me eternal life. And you will keep your promise, not because of me, but because of your gospel. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.